Nebuchadnezzar, remember this whole chapter is his testimony. He's saying, this is what I saw. This is what Daniel told me. Now, Daniel is actually writing it down, but he is writing it down as it happened, you know, to, and, and probably, probably actually looking at the official record that, uh, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had put together on it. So, that's where we are. The session in a sentence, God humbles the proud so that they can recognize his authority and praise him. Let's look at chapter 4, verses 29 and 30. <clears throat> chapter 4, verses 29 and 30. Let's go ahead and do this, uh, chapter 20, I mean, verse 28. All this happened to the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. That means all of that stuff that Daniel prophesied happened. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty. So what's the problem here? A bit too much of himself. <laughs> Thinks a little too much of himself? He's big-headed. He's big-headed. Now remember, this is a guy who had a big statue of himself built and made everybody about to bow down to it. I mean, it's the same guy, right? Anything else? Okay. He don't know how to listen to people who are advising him. He doesn't know how to listen to people. And why is that? He's the man. He's, He's the man. man. Well, because God gives him the just and unjust alike. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> it's amazing that that D and and Gavin have lived to the ripe old age that they are. <laughs> because of this first phrase here. Yeah. Okay, listen, son. Listen, I'm going to tell you. When you're mowing the yard, okay, you can't just do it in a haphazard way. You mow straight lines and then you come back and mow the next line. That way you don't miss stuff. You understand what I'm saying? But don't do it halfway. Miss stuff. I got this. Good. 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 Haven't you, haven't you heard that? I mean, I've got this. I've got this. You may have people that you work with who say, I got this. I got this. Mm -hmm. I got this. How about, I did this. I did this. That's what, that's what he would say. I did this. I did this. One time, there was, there was more than one, but one time I really agreed with Obama, but not for the same reasons. When he, saw, when he said to someone, you didn't build that, now, he was saying something entirely different. But the fact is, when we say, I built this, we better be sure and remember that God was involved. I've told this joke before. Those of you that are old, just laugh anyway. Farmer working out in the field. Pastor stops by. Farmer gets off of his tractor, walks over to the fence. The preacher comes over, talks to him, said, my, 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 you and the Lord have done wonders with this land. The farmer said, yeah, but you should have seen when the Lord had it by itself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for laughing. <laughs> but we do, we tend to think, man, we, we got this. I did this. I got this. I did. I, 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 I. Somebody looked up Proverbs 16, 18. Yeah. And somebody look up Luke 12, 16 through 20. Somebody got the Proverbs passage? What does it say? Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before they fall. Oh, yeah! That's all you got to say, right? And believe you me, there have been plenty of times when my fall happens right after I was thinking, I got this. Mm -hmm. Look what I did. Look what I did. How about the Luke passage? 16 through 20. He told them a parable, saying, The land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all of my grain and my goods. 
And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? <clears throat> okay, first he says, I did this. And then he says, I got this. I know what I'm going to do now. No, he and God a, says, you're a fool. He said, God, God got this. You know about this. You're a fool. You're a fool. What God said, you're a fool. <coughs> Two words that are critical for this passage. Sin and pride. And look what's right in the middle of both of them. Isn't that right? You can't spell team with an I. That's good. But there is an M and an E. Yeah, there is a me in there. <laughs> sin, sin is all about me. You want to talk about me? You want to talk about I? You want to talk That's about I? We keep. Yes. Guys, sin is selfishness. Hey, you're going to write something down if you got your book. Now, see. Okay? When we sin, we are acting out of a selfish attitude and mindset that assumes our action will lead us to more happiness than if we were to obey God. Sin is manifesting in our tendency to be curved inward towards ourselves. Um, this week, Pam uh, posted something on Facebook, and I, I stole it from her. Of course, it wasn't original with her. She stole it from Corinthian Boo. Um, but, uh, by the way, if you're not her friend on Facebook, I encourage you to uh, friend her. She writes some absolutely incredible things. When's her book coming out? Yeah, it's, I've asked her that. I know, I know, I know, I know, and I've tried to Hey, Pam, when's the book coming out? Yeah. See, she answered me. She already said, I hear your voice in Bible study. I'm <laughs> here. <laughs> yes, um, but anyway, she uh, posted this from Corey Tindon. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. If you look at God, you'll be at rest. You know, that was a lady who endured the uh, concentration camps of Nazi Germany. I mean, she should know about the distress, the depression, and the rest that can be found. Let's go on. Verses 31 through 33. The words were still on his lips. What words? I got this. I did this. The words were still on his lips when a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from the people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like cattle. Seven times will pass, will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Immediately. Immediately. This says God graciously humbles those who walk in pride. This doesn't seem to me like a very gracious. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I mean, this is some serious stuff. This is seven years of this. This is seven years. Okay? By the way, we have a, a counselor in our midst. We have a, a doctor. We have those who have studied psychology and all of that. If you were going to give a diagnosis to this, what would you call it? Which one? To the, I mean, to King Nebuchadnezzar, when he was, um, let me see, he he had grass like cattle. He stayed out in the field. His body was drenched like dew, and his hair kept growing and all that. So what? Gosh, okay, with schizophrenia. Schizophrenic? Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I was thinking too. 
Yes, yes. Okay. I mean, this is serious, isn't it? This is serious. So, I asked the question Does everybody with schizophrenia have a problem with God? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Well, <laughs> if they are turning to him, they do, but is that the reason that they have it? No. No. Okay.
Stop right there. Do you realize what he's saying? That's a song. That's a prayer. Right? I mean, he is praising God. He is singing God's praises. Now, this is the same guy who, when he saw the three boys in the barbecue pit, <laughs> praised God then, too. But what happened? That was just, he was just saying, your God is a great God among many. Now, he's starting to figure this whole thing out. <laughs> yeah, you are the God. You are the God. Go on with verse 36. At the same time my sanity restored was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven. That is the king of heaven. Because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Wow. God's still in that same work. Someone look up uh, 1 Peter 5, 6. Somebody got it? Got it. Psalm 94, 12. Got it. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Got it. Okay. 1 Peter 5, 6. What does it say? Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Now there's a passage in James that says almost the exact same thing. Guys, guys, <coughs> humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Realize that God's hand can humble you. Realize who he is. Realize <laughs> who God is, what he is, and who he is to you. And he will exalt you. How about Psalm 94 12? Joyful are those you visit, the Lord, and those you keep with your instruction. That's right. That's right. When I played basketball, um, I, I was the height that I am now when I was in junior high. Okay? <laughs> basketball coach loved me, he didn't even care. <laughs> If I went down on the offensive end, he just parked me in the middle of the lane on defense and said, Young, you just stay there. <laughs> okay. And so if anybody came around, I would I would play in a junior high, you know, all I had to do was stand like that. Right? I mean, I just my wingspan was enough that I could just reach out and right. However, as you grow older, I didn't grow any taller, <laughs> okay? And all of a sudden, there's guys I'm playing who are as tall as me or taller than me. And I had a coach who really can't coach Sheehan. Ooh, ooh. He was a Yankee and I hated him. I hated that man because of the things he made me do. He put me on the rebounding machine. And I had to rebound 100 rebounds in a row. He put me in. But the thing that he taught me more than anything else was how to back somebody out of the lane when I was on defense. He said, Young, you take that big old behind of yours. Only didn't use the word behind. You take that big old behind of yours and you just back them up with it. Just put it on them and back up. And then when you go up for the ball, they'll be. And so he would put guys behind me who would fight me. I mean, just literally shove at me to get me. To, and I hated it. I hated it. I hated it. That was the guy that when I broke my wrist, when I broke my wrist in a training exercise, we were having to be working with the football people. Okay. It was an off season thing. We were all in the gym and we were doing bear crawls, doing bear crawls, kind of like horses on the, only to the, to the uh, free throw line and back, and then to the half-court line, and back. Bear crawls. I broke my wrist running into the wall on a sprint. Broke it. Broke it. Right there. I went over to him. I said, Coach, I think, I think my wrist is broken. Now, I had done this when I was in sixth grade, so I knew what a broken wrist felt like. I think it's broken. Can you move it like that? Yeah. Does it hurt? I said, yeah, a little bit. He said, just get back in line. 
The next thing was a bear crawl. Oh, you know what a bear crawl is? No. That's where you're on your feet and your hands. Not your knees and your hands. Your feet and your hands. And you go like this. I can't quite picture that. Arlen, show us. Can you show us? Can you show us? <laughs> yeah, Arlen could do it. Arlen could do it. Do not tell me you are. So I go to, I, I do my bear crawl. I go to free throw line back, half court line and back. I went over there and I said, Coach, I really think it's broken. She said, You just did a bear crawl. It ain't broken. I said, yeah, coach, it is, and I'm going to go ahead and go see the doctor. And I walked off the court. Came back the next day with a cast on. <laughs> and he said, it was really broken? I said, yes. I hated the man. But let me tell you, after he put me through those drills, those rebounding drills that I absolutely hated, after he put me through them and through them and through them, after he put me through the, re the drills of backing people out of the lane, I became a dynamite rebounder. And every time I went up and got the ball, I rejoiced. You were throwing it. You know, just like it yeah. said. Okay, look at Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wonderful? For it is God who is at work in you, according to his plan, according to his will, to develop you, to turn you into the person he wants you to be. Man, that's glorious. That's glorious. Now, I hated Coach Sheehan. I had coaches that I loved, and, and, and I loved them for the sake of But isn't it glorious that coaches, we've got a couple of coaches there, isn't it, isn't it glorious that coaches invest their time in helping young men and young women grow? Isn't that wonderful? They invest their time. And, and it's not just investing their time to make sure that they, you know, play the game right. They're investing their time to make sure that they grow up as responsible adults. God is constantly coaching. Now, I want all of you to go to that second, uh, the Philippians 2 chapter, because we're going to have to, you're going to need to refer to it real quick. See, what we have con what we have here in Daniel 4 is a contrast between Nebuchadnezzar and Jesus. Okay? Whether you've seen it or not, here it is. And by the way, it's still in blanks now. Nebuchadnezzar forced his subjects to what? Worship? Okay. I think they used a different word, but yeah. Worship is right. Serve him. Okay? <clears throat> so, Jesus became what of all according to Joseph? Serve. Serve. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar demanded what by means of his strength and threats of death. Obedience. I thought it was obedience. He demanded honor. Okay. I, I to me, disobedience worked. How about um, himself before God the Father exalted him. He humbled himself. Okay. Jesus humbled himself. Nebuchadnezzar. What about his greatness? As the king of Babylon. Huh? Oh, was he ever proud. Yeah. And Jesus, what did Jesus teach? Now, this is in Luke 9, but what did he teach? The least. That the least of these are the greatest. Right? Let's look at Isaiah 56, I mean 55, verses 6 through 9. And James 4, 6 through 10. Somebody have Isaiah 55? Got it. How about James 4, 6 through 10? Somebody got that one? Good. How about, what does Isaiah say? Yeah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call to him while he is near. Let the wicked one abandon his way and the sinful one his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. 
that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will freely for he will freely forgive. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. Wow. You know, when we when we start thinking, I got this, we need to remember that. <laughs> my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. You may think you got this, but you ain't got nothing. You ain't got nothing. How about James 4, 6, hang on. James 4, 6 through 10. But he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Turn to him, you sinners, and purify your hearts, and your mind, and submit and mourn, and weep. But your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Has to be. Has to be because of who God is. Here it is, right here. We, when we realize who we are in relation to the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, and omnibenevolent, benevolent God, we have nowhere to go but to our knees in praise and worship. That's what Nebuchadnezzar did. That's that's what happened because he found out God really is the one, not a one, but the one God is trans I gotta wrap up real quick. I'm sorry. God is transcendent. God is distinct from and independent of his created world. He is transcendent over us in regard to his greatness and power as well as his goodness and purity. Understanding God's transcendence evokes awe and wonder at his goodness and power. Guys those who walk in pride are blind to God's authority. I mean, all of us have been there. Every one of us has been there. Every one of us has said, I got this. Every one of us has said, I got this. You know, maybe it's something that, that you do on a regular basis. You know? And you've done it so many times, you say, I got this. And you know what? Basically, you do. How wonderful it is to say to the Lord, hey, help me out with this. I think I got it, but just in case. God graciously humbles those who walk in pride. Oh, does he ever. <laughs> does he ever. And praise of God replaces pride in those who have been humbled. When we realize who he is, we don't have any choice to be crazy. When we're on on our knees, there's only one way to look. And that's a how should we live? Because we have been given life through Christ's humility. Remember, he humbled himself even to the point of death, the death on a cross. That's in the Philippians 2 thing. He humbled himself. And before that, earlier in the passage, it says we are to have the same attitude as Christ Jesus had. Who did not think equality with God was something to be grasped. He was God himself. And even he wasn't saying, I got this. He was turning to the Father. We follow his example and walk with humility as we seek to selfless, selflessly serve those around us. Um, I hope you don't have to wander around in a field as a schizophrenic for seven years with your hair coming like feathers and your toenails and, and fingernails coming like claws. By the way, by the way, the older you get, the more your toenails start to look like Fritos anyway. So, you know, just get ready for that. Get ready for that. That's coming. That's coming. I think off my shoes, y'all scream in horror. You know, I'm telling you. Six weeks later, my mother said, I, I, I think I know what has happened. 
think I know why. My sister and I were listening to this, and she said, God is punishing me because the only thing I put in front of him was my husband and my son. And she's sitting there telling this to, to her two daughters, too, because I didn't love anybody more than God except my husband and my son. Well, my my brother was her pride and joy. I mean, she didn't want daughters. She wanted all three boys, and she didn't get yeah. boys. So she didn't really have a relationship with my mother, sister and I. She said, so he's punishing me to get put them, you know, to put him first. He says, I'm a, I'm a selfish God, and I want nobody first. And, and this hearing this all this morning about discipline, discipline, this wise lady said, Betty, I, I, have, I disagree with you. I think God disciplines us. But I don't want to think of him as a punishing God. I think he wants you back. He wants you where he wants were. He wants right. that. But it's a discipline. Think of a loving God that disciplines just like you discipline your children more than you punish them. You right. discipline them. So I, I heard that all today was discipline, discipline, right. and not punish. And I heard that. I remember telling my girls when they were punished for two weeks for doing something wrong. It's called discipline. We're required to discipline you because God asks us to. Just like God disciplines us, we're disciplining you because we love you. So I heard that. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Well, and even the root word for discipline mm -hmm. is, is teach. We'll teach. Yeah. Teach. You yeah. know, the, when you get it down to the bottom line, it's it's teaching. And then she also said, and God's also told her in six weeks, now you've got two grown daughters. Do you want a relationship with them or not? Because I can think them away too. I mean, she was real listening and, and trying to figure out what's a purpose of this, and she did become a whole different mother to us, even as adults. Let, let's pray. Father, there are times that we put things, like we put people before you. Father, show us. Show us where we're, where we're missing the mark. Show us where we are are putting anything in front of you. Help us to recognize you as the all-powerful, all-loving God you are. So that you don't have to discipline us so harshly. So that you can teach us and we will immediately get the point. And go about praising your name because we know you even better. Help us, Father. Help us, Father, to trust you in all things, even when the discipline comes. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.